sure and uh, mute your microphone so when you're not recording. All right, what's up, everyone? This is Frederick with Opinions.com. I am here live here to interview Nathan Fouts from Mama's Best Games and not Big Mama's Games. Like, <laughs> I made the mistake pre show. Nathan, what's up? How are you doing? Thanks for being there with us. Hey, Brent, I'm doing great. Yeah, it's Mommy's Best Games, although Big Mama's Games is pretty great. We could think about it. We could potentially uh, <laughs> work something out and see a second launch, a second studio, just in the tradition of uh, of uh, Mama's Best Games might might be something to consider as a partnership between Opinoobs and yourself. But, uh, <laughs> right. but thanks for having us, Nathan. We're obviously excited to speak about your latest game, Explosionade. But before we get there, we're going to talk about the studio. And before we even get there, we're going to talk about yourself as a gamer. And we want to figure out who Nathan Fouts is first and foremost most what led him to game development and uh let's start with a basic question are you yourself a gamer um yeah yeah i like i'm pretty i'm older i'm 40 so i like um grew up with the atari and the ColecoVision and nest and the super nest and the genesis and uh yeah i've been playing games for a while and i'm i always kind of i drift back towards shoot 'em ups and pixel games and stuff like that but i like contemporary things too i've been playing like the dark soul series and stuff like that what did you start on how old were you when you tackled your first game oh that was on the atari um i was probably six seven um i um eight i we played um we played berserk and um yeah it was, it was great like we were at my uh, babysitter's house and their son was about, um, say, 13. And he would go to school. And when he got home from school and I got home, I got home a little bit before him. And uh, I had beat his score on Berserk, even though I was probably only half his age. And he was really angry about that. And so, like, immediately he had to sit down and beat my score then. But So yeah. the moment you started, you pretty much got competitive. And maybe yeah, that, well, is, what, yeah. maybe I mean, that is what drove you to game development. Could be, yeah. I mean, I I love I do I love the hard games like shoot 'em ups and stuff like that. And um, I'm not great at them, but I'm I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. So, and so, so Explosion Eight. I don't want to get too much into it, but very much a game that reminds me of the arcade days. Uh, it it that has that retro feel, even though it's fast paced and, and it's a it's a um, shoot one up. Uh, but it's, it's, yeah, you can tell. My, I guess my question is, have any of those early titles, uh, the titles maybe not from the Atari, but then moving forward in your teenager years, have any of these titles influenced Mommy's Best Games? And not just Explosion Aid to that sense, but but all of your titles. Absolutely. I mean, I, I like, I, a lot of times in the, in the shoot-em-ups, I don't personally always play them for score, or I used to not. I used to play them for content. So, like, one of my favorites is R-Type. And I would just like all the crazy alien designs and the neat levels, and especially the level design in that game is amazing. Um, but now that I've gone back to the older arcade um, shoot 'em ups, I really have been starting to get into them more for score. And I like to—I'm on the shmups forums sometimes, and I—I I I like watching um, really good plays and trying to learn, you know, how to do, you know, some best moves and like milking bosses for points. I don't know. I've kind of gotten into it. I still like content the most, like really cool monsters. But um, I am kind of getting into score, and I, I pay attention to that when I'm making my games. So. And are you a uh, your so Opinoobs? Just to give you a little bit of a context, Opinoobs is totally PC centric. Uh, we're obsessed by the PC gaming as a platform. Are you yourself a PC gamer, or you do do you swing both ways? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a buy gamer. Um, yeah, I. I I play, um, <laughs> I, I grew up as a console gamer, but I've definitely come around to playing PC games as well. Um, it, it was funny, like, I grew up as a console gamer, but then even with, like, Ultima um, Underworld, um, my friend had the PC, and I was blown away by, like, the three graphics and just the, the, the strange, it, it didn't even have, like, a boxy look to it. Ultima Underworld just had this amazing rolling kind of terrain to it so advanced back then and um i loved it and and i mean like i my mind was blown when i first saw doom on pc oh yeah i remember my friend was like oh, yeah, yeah he was i was hanging out with another buddy it was three of us in a room and we were kind of fiddling with the guitar and my pc buddy was loading and he's just messing with the computer all night we're like dude come on come on over you know hang on over here let's look at some magazines what are you like trying to load and he got Doom running for the first time, <laughs> and I could have sworn I could see into the computer. 
like I hadn't seen 3D graphics that that sh the lighting like yeah, that. Yeah. I just blew my mind. And so that yeah, double I mean, barrel shotgun was just everything to me. It made me a PC gamer. Doom is the game actually. I'm 33 years old, so I'm a, I'm a few years behind you. But Doom is the game that brought me to to PC and and never left me. <laughs> I'm still well, excited about the the next Doom and. And everything, I don't yeah. know if... I, I'd love to hear your opinion on that before we move on to your own studio. It's, uh, they've built up a lot of hype on, on Doom, the, the original game, and they're, they released one, I think it was maybe six, seven, more, even more than that now, I think, uh, six, seven years ago. And uh, it may, I didn't think it captured that much of the... the uh, they did a decent job, but now they're building the, the whole hype against the next one. Are you excited about that? Man, I mean, like... If I can live through six, eight bad Sonic the Hedgehogs, I can live through a couple of bad Dooms for sure. I mean, like Doom 3 was the only kind of misstep for me. So they've got a lot of credit still for me. Like, but um, Doom 4, you know, the next Doom, yeah, I think I, I think they could be fast learners. I could ever, you know, they could learn from the problems. And um, I mean, I don't know, like, how can you screw up not putting a flashlight on a gun? I don't like you know what I mean. So right. in some ways, right. it just makes you scared. Like if you if you see some some problem like that so obvious, then it makes you worry that maybe they blew something really bad with Doom Four. But also maybe they were kind of humbled by it, and hopefully Doom Four would they'll pay a little more attention. It's the yeah. it's the type of uh, titles uh, that's it's a real challenge to put together and actually make a successful title because first the, the level of expectation. Uh, Doom is the type of games that innovated first and foremost and so what does it mean to create a, the next game 20 years later because it's been at least 20 years now uh, and, oh. and at the same time do you take the lessons from what we learned uh, I, I feel like there's a revival lately uh, of, of games like even the, in the RPG front the, the Baldur's Gate and all those games that came out recently and there's a I'm personally struggling with this this new wave of games that we used to enjoy for the simple reason that um, I feel like some of the some of the features and even the dynamics of the games that are being picked up and modernized uh, they, they rely a little bit too much on our feeling of nostalgia and they they bring back completely outdated systems from the way things get uh, categorized in your inventory and just the, the whole way games function that really doesn't work for me as well uh, anymore uh, at 33 years old uh, just because the industry has evolved and it's it, it I want to relate it to I want to relate to your game and, and your studio because this is probably something these are probably things that you think of when you design game dynamics it's uh, it's okay we're going to revive a little bit the retro genre we're going to make some games that appeal to our memories and, and stuff we used to play back then in an arcade uh, shooter. Um, do you guys deal with that? Is like, how do we make it appealing in 2015 uh, when these are really a revival of what we used to play when we were younger? Well, it's a definitely. Good question. I mean, um, the main thing that I do whenever I'm going about designing a new game is I start with the gameplay. And if the gameplay doesn't get me excited, it's not an idea. I just don't, it doesn't even come to paper. It doesn't go into the computer, into the notes at all. So when I think of anything that I'm going to make, like, um, like Explosion Aid, the, well, I'll talk another, we'll talk about that one later. I'll talk about Shoot One Up. So Shoot One Up is also out on Steam. And that game started with the idea of a shoot 'em up where you control all your spaceships at the same time. So all your lives are active. So all your one ups, that's why I should shoot one up. All your one ups are active all at once, and that was it. I mean, and then I take the art, you know, take the art forward from some different inspirations. But the point is, I make sure that I'm, I mean, maybe even doubly aware of it. I make sure we innovate on some front of gameplay before we continue forward with the whole game. But so I don't go ahead. I consider the retro. The nostalgia crutch at all i mean it's just what we we just do i love it and so but i make sure that i'm not wasting the player's time and we give them something new you know but your projects uh because I, I there's a split between uh indie devs right now there's those who really cater to an audience mainly because they're driven by the fundraising process and and and, and software's online software like 
Kickstarters and all that good stuff. And then there's, you're going to find developers that are, no, they don't care all that much. Uh, they don't care that much. They want to do their personal project. And sometimes these are the projects that work better. Uh, it's, it's not listening to an audience can actually please the audience. Uh, we, we see that a lot. Uh, I think nobody would have expected a game like Minecraft to have the success that it had, uh, especially and, and probably through Kickstarter or something like that, it would have been deviated in some shape or form. So hats, I guess what I'm saying is hats off to you for, for going with what you want to play uh, and, and just following your passion rather than uh, the law of supply and demand. Well, I mean, like, I, I can't remember who said this, but basically, for the most part, you, me, other gamers, other people taking in media, we say we know what we want, but we actually don't. What we want is we know what we want when we see it but I can't tell you what I want. So if you ask me to tell you what I want, I'm not going to think of Minecraft. Like I'm just not, you know what I mean? But when you see it, then you're like, holy crap, I do want that, you know? But if you ask me what I want, I'll tell you a, a like a mush, a blender version of a blended version of all the junk I already like. And that's not as cool as what some other developer is going to think of. You know what I mean? And that makes a so, lot of sense. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I, I totally agree with that. Let's let, let's talk about the studio, uh, mm -hmm. the, the history of the studio. Mama's best games, and you got you you just had. I'm sure you get it a lot, but you have to start with the name. Um, <laughs> why moms? Why did you pick on moms? No, we love our moms, right? I I'm mean, sure. I, I, we all love our moms. So um, I was just a weird in joke with a buddy a long time ago where we laughed about. Um, that our mom makes the best stuff. You know what I mean? It wouldn't be funny if our moms made games. They would be the best games. So it's just sort of like that. It was just like, you know, if your mom makes the best food and the best cookies and, you know, and does the best with the clothes and everything like that, and, and surely your mom would make really great games. So and, and it's so you, you started with that. When, when was the start? When did you get started with Mama's Best Games? We founded Mommy's Best Games in 2007, and I say we because uh, my wife and I are the co-owners. Awesome. And, and, yeah, and so she does the business. and um, Project and of love. Yeah, yeah, she handles all the books, and she actually does contribute to the design sometimes. And um, I handle basically the game-making stuff. So um, she keeps you out of jade while, while you're creating. Well, you know, she um, helps uh, act as a producer. So she'll kind of say... Really? Are you sure you need to spend another <laughs> night on the bar, on bar physics or something like that? You know, and I'll say yes, the bar physics. We've got to get it right. The bar physics or, important. Or, or or I'll say, you know what? We don't need another variation on you know a tentacle monster. You're right. So she does. She kind of calls me on it and makes me kind of explain myself if I am putting in a girl with, whose boobs are too big or something. Then she'll say, Are you Consulting. sure? Yeah, are you sure about that? And I'll try to explain that why we absolutely need a robot android, you know, nude woman in Shoot One Up. And then she'll say, oh, okay. Yeah, so there's a case to be made why, why that's important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, she, like I said, she's kind of like a producer. But. That's awesome. So she, and it's also a great way to get your, uh, your wife to support you in your video gaming addiction. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. I get a lot of um, write offs when it comes to tax time buying games and consoles i get to say it's research you see of course yeah so absolutely i do the same thing with opinions.com and uh, i get my wife to i get my wife she's not uh, she's not part of the business but she's very interested to see where the business is going to go and i, I play That's off great. of that That's awesome. <laughs> it's important yeah. uh, so, so um what kind of motivated you to to create the studio uh you've what i guess what can you tell us about that that transformation from just being a gamer to becoming a game developer? Well, actually, I've been a developer in the, I guess you'd say, professional industry since '98. Oh wow! And I, I worked at Running with Scissors, and I I, awesome. I, developed, I helped develop Postal Two. Oh wow! And I worked on um, I worked at um, Insomniac Games, and I worked on PlayStation Three launch titles, and uh, I did um, Resistance: Fall of Man. So I did the weapons in Resistance: Fall of Man. So we've had, I already have tons of questions just popping in my head, but uh, so you have like a decade of experience before, even more than that, you have 14, 15 yeah. years of experience in game development, uh, some of it in mainstream. Uh, yeah. You've actually seen the inside of Valve software. Um, big questions there. So 
that is that what drove you to game development uh, as a, is, to indie development uh, is is the fact that you worked in yeah. the mainstream and you've been motivated to do your own thing like uh, some sort of frustration or are we actually looking at no it's a, it's an extension of a, it's just a continuation of my career well i mean we split off i started in 98 and then we split off in 2007 and um 2008 was when we released our first game and so from independent so prior to that that was mainstream and i just felt like i paid my dues and i was kind of getting burnt out from working on a big team and you got to remember this is back before indie was big and this was back um even when geometry wars had come out only a year a year or two on the xbox 360 in 2007 so um you know at that point i just kind of saw that geometry wars was making real money as a small game and i was working on big games like ratchet and clank series and duke nukem series and things like that and i really wanted to i just love i love side scrolling platformers shooters and stuff like that and instead i mean i like 2d art and sprites and stuff like that and we were making 3d games and they're great games but i just wanted to make something different it wasn't you know? your fit uh, it just wasn't your yeah fit. Well, I had a lot of fun at those big games. I did, and I learned a lot. Um, but I just figured at that point, hey, let's try it, you know. And so it started to work out. We had a big, our first game, Weapon of Choice, won a bunch of awards, and you know it was going well. It's awesome. So, it's done well. Just about every game we released has won some awards. So I think I think we're doing pretty good. That's awesome. So it's, it's it, but it was a big jump, and he must oh, have yeah. he must have scary. taken some courage. Yeah, he must have taken a lot of courage to 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 jump into the indie scene and start your own studio. Um, I commend it, and uh, definitely wish you the best as, as you guys as you guys keep going. Do you have any uh, Do you have any ambitions to expand the studio and bringing more talent, or do you or do you want to keep it more of a personal affair? Well, depending on the game, we do work with other people. So um, we did Serious Sam Double D XXL on Steam and Xbox Live Arcade, and that was with a publisher, Devolver Digital, and. Um, on that game, we had... That's the guys behind uh, Hotline Miami. Yeah, yeah, we worked with them. They, they came to us. They said, we like your games. And they said, can you make a 2D Serious Sam? That's like awesome. Contra style. It's like yeah. Contra, but it's Serious Sam. I said, heck yeah, that's, that's our forte. You know, that's what we do. So um, they loved it. We, we created this thing called the Gun Stacker, where you stack guns one on top of the other. Yeah. And shoot all the monsters. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's a big seller. Um, so for that game, we had, I mean, we had uh, another programmer, another artist. We had a lot of, we, another programmer, another artist, musician, story writer. I mean, and then we had the whole crew from Devolver doing like the vocals and stuff like that. We had the original guy that is a serious Sam voice and new people doing the voice acting. So we kind of, from a contractor standpoint, we grow, we grow based on what we need. But then for smaller games, like Shoot One Up, um, I did that. And then the, we had the uh, musician, and that was basically it. So uh, you know, it depends on the game size. Before we move on to Explosion Aid, what are you proudest of uh, from the other titles? Oh, it depends on the title, but like I, like I said, I try to make sure we have at least one amazing, incredible thing in there. And so for like Serious Sam, it's the gun stacker. I mean, we made that up. Nobody made up a gun stacker before. What so is the gun stacker? I'm not familiar with it. Oh, just type in Gunstacker in the just, internet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's the best. There's an incredible video. Devolver made us. They loved it so hard. They like they they made us this an unbelievable two different unbelievable videos about it. Um, and then like on on shoot one up. I mean like the the multi ship system is is amazing. No one's done that before either. So we we try to make we try to make sure there's something amazing in every game. Innov and innovation is very much at the heart of it. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Especially like a gameplay innovation that you'll come to the game for something cool. And the game itself will be great, but like you'll you know you'll get a new experience or some kind of twist that you weren't expecting. So Okay, so Explosion Aid. Um, even before we talk about the game concept, the dynamics, the length, uh, how hard is it and all that good stuff. Uh, what what made you want to what made you want to create that game? Is there a, is there a side story you can share, or just the reason why you 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 started developing Explosion Aid? Yeah, um, that was back on the Xbox Live Indie um, section of Xbox 360, 
And that was at a really weird time when we had the race to the bottom and it was still hot back on the indie side, you know, on that section. And um, we just said, we are in the middle of another project, which is still on pause. Grapple Buggy is another game that we still never finished. And um, I just kind of talked to my wife and I said, I think we can make a new game very quickly and have it do well. And she said, all right, go for it. You got a month. She said, you got a month to do this. Are you serious? Yes, yes. Thirty. It took us 38 days to finish. You're kidding crazy. me. You, can, you did, you did this. Polished. Yeah. You did this game in 30 minutes, in, th in, in days, 30 days, I'm sorry. 38 days, 38 days, yes. So um, Out of all the interviews we've done, that is by far a record. I mean, even the most basic games, and we've done a few interviews on some <laughs> basic games. The production yeah. is always at least six months. That's well, it. and this one... You guys are fast. I mean, we just, you know, sometimes you just have it, well, everything just lines up. You know, in some projects, no matter what you're doing. Yeah, it's your experience too that also probably speeds the process. Right, right, right. And and just sometimes things you just luck out and things fall right into place. And um, this was uh, the guy I'd worked with at the time. He had worked with me on um, uh, the the previous game, and he and I just clicked just right. He developed the level editor from scratch, and I just cranked through the art. And then we just started banging out the gameplay. And then we had the level, you know, software from scratch there that we started making levels on. And it just worked. And like, it was so fun. I mean, we had a blast doing it. So, yep. That's awesome. Do you guys play your own games? Are you kidding me? We play them until we're sick of them. Like, <laughs> That's awesome. We have to test <laughs> yeah. just like while we're sleeping. You just have to, you know what I mean? Like, you just test constantly. I was just testing today. We've got a mobile game on Apple and Android called um, Finger Derpy, and there's a new update for it coming out in like next week. And I mean, I just I make my kids test, I test. I don't make them test, you know what I mean? But they get to test, and even even when you're done, you think you're you think you've found all the problems. I just found a problem today that I'm working on getting rid of. So. So you're just, the type you're the type of guy who just hashes games left and right. It's it's a true passion. Yeah, I mean like. It just there's too many ideas, right? I don't want to die yeah. with a big folder full of stuff I didn't get to do. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair. So okay, for for people who may not be uh, who may not be familiar with uh, Explosion Aid, how would you define it? How would you describe it? Um, the original name of the game was not as cool, but in a way more descriptive. It used to be called during development. It was called Take the Base, and the idea the kernel was. You've got this tight little tough mech, and you've got these hold up little tiny smart aliens, and they want they don't want you to get inside their base, and you've just got to rip it up, tear it up, you know, and get them out of their hidey holes, and like they're, they're like hedgehogs, they're like you know tight down in there, and they're throwing yeah. grenades at you. So yeah, so take the base was was like you've got to you got to defeat these wily tricky aliens, and they're kind of cowardly. Yeah, but you've got grenades <laughs> and you know, a laser gun and everything to stop them and a cool shield, but um, they're really a little tricky. So I, we put extra work into the AI for these guys more than you usually see in a side scroller. So how hard is the game? Well, you know what's funny is the game is not supposed to be that hard, and, and it's not meant to be tough. It's meant to be just sort of freewheeling, blow up everything, have a lot of fun. And um, little challenge, supposed to be enough challenge, kind of like you eat some food and you're like a little spice, my yeah. mouth's a little warm, but not too bad. You know, I'm not crying. And so Explosion Aid's the same way. And the real fun is getting somebody over to the house and playing two player. It's local only, but you get a controller, you, you can, somebody can play on the keyboard, somebody, you know, a mouse, somebody can play on a controller, or you get sure. two controllers is the best. And you just tear through all the levels with a buddy. And um, if you want a challenge, you can crank it up to serious. And, um, and then it can get a little, it can get challenging. So how, not, how, long does, how long does it take the average gamer, like a guy like me, how long does it take him to finish the game? And how long does it take you to finish the game? Well, it's a little tricky because, I mean, it depends on how, it's cool because the levels reward you different ways. So you can play for time and you get a point bonus to get out of the level as fast as you can. You can play to not kill anything yeah. and try to beat the level. You get another bonus for that. 
or you can play for an all clear, which is I think most people's favorite. And you that, that takes a while to in some are, some levels are longer to clear out all the enemies, but then you get a bonus for that. And um, it takes a couple man yeah, couple hours. It's not too long, but the fun part is the different difficulty setting settings. They have different enemies and um, level setups. They're not completely different, but they're like enhanced. So if you start with a buddy on chilled, and I'm I'm not going to call this a girlfriend game, but I know a lot of guys that do play, with them, you know, because it's an easier game. So you go into chilled, and the cool part is there's a That's lot of so sexy stuff. Nathan. What's that? <laughs> That's so sexist. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, listen, Your wife I'll say it like this: the girls can play with the boys. Then, if the girls like to play more and they want to drag their boyfriends in, they don't play. They can do that. Sure. Let me put it a different way, a better way. That's not so sexist. And I'm sorry about that. Let's say your gamer friend and your non-gamer friend, your sort of casual player, whoever they may be. Uh, yeah. make the, you know, the hardcore the hardcore play, player can drag in their casual player. And um, and then they can get them to play because it's not as hard. And the other fun part is you share, you can split health. So if somebody goes out and the okay. casual player dies, you can drag in the you know the. Can be nice. Pull through. You can be a good husband. Yeah. <laughs> whoa. whoa. Well, let's that's just face it. Like you're <laughs> she wouldn't even know where to begin. <laughs> well, there you go. But this game's good for that. Um, and uh, and we've even got gameplay setting changes, so you can change the gameplay speed. So you can turn it down to 75%. So you can actually take it a little bit harder, but then slow things down and you know and have an easier time at it. So it, it's, it also sounds like it's a good game to play while drinking. That's true. It is a really good game to be a little bit off. Yeah. You can be sloppy in this game and still have fun. Now, the funny thing is, if you take it up to serious, you will get kind of punished for being too sloppy. Um, and that's I still think that's fun. You know what I mean? Like It's kind of fun if you're drinking with a friend and then you're just like, You're goofing off, and then you just keep getting beat down, and you're like, "Damn it, we gotta focus." Yeah, focus. we gotta you know get this I mean? right. <laughs> you really gotta focus to get through. You know what I mean? And then you, you know, but not every level's like that. It's there's, there's a few walls in the game, but not too many where it's tougher. Okay, how, in, in, what about bosses? Uh, how do you design bosses? You know, it's funny in in Explosion Day, we made the bosses different. Usually, in a lot of my games, I make them all crazy, wild, different monsters. But in this one, we had like a story theory behind them. Hmm. And so the bosses are kind of related. We call them all berserkers. They, we wanted to call them beholders. We thought that was too close to like Dungeons and Dragons or something. So okay. we call them berserkers. Um, and, uh, or vice versa. I can't remember what we settled on. But the, um, the, the, they're all sort of like related to these giant one-eyed creatures with all these tentacles coming off of them. Yeah, I but know. They've this. got different variations on it's, them. Uh, like, it's, it's the main one on the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one of those. The final one's really yucky looking, really nasty. But then there's like baby versions. None of them are, no, none of them are very attractive to begin no, with. No, they're all pretty gross. <laughs> I got to tell yeah, you. Really, these are the games <laughs> playing about how disgusting the monsters were. So they were really sad, you know, just put off by how gross the creatures were. And this, way, this way you don't feel bad shooting them up. Yeah, it's true. It's true. So it's totally okay. It's, it makes it totally acceptable. Uh, yeah, so a couple of last questions. Uh, the game releases, um, do you immediately move on? Um, or do you, are, is it still a focus for you? Um, the game releases, what we usually do is we basically stay with it. And especially at this point, there's always... There's the ability to um, tune things with the with a, a release, and so I always watch the reviews and make sure we didn't screw anything up. Like we try to be meticulous about everything, but you just can't predict uh, all the problems you're going to run into, all the all the requests of people. And so I don't, we're not going to kill ourselves for one random request. But if I see a trend, and you know, people say, "Hey, I really like this option of like a laser sight or something like that." I'll just say, oh crap, that's a good, you know, that's really. We plug that in, you know, and we have a playtesting time, and you know, if those things don't get called out, then I'll just, you know, we'll look at it, so we'll see. And um, I like to make sure, like as a as a pedigree, sort of as the um, a library, I want to make sure our games hold up over time. So I, I make sure they're they're treated sure, well, sure. and they, you know what I mean, they're not just junk. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, no. It's yeah, not. so we like to make sure that they're solid. So I do hang out with the game for a month or two afterwards, and then if everything's cool, then we move on. 
But then even say six months later, I'm uh, half the time I'm ended up back having to deal with them. Like when we ported the games for the Xbox 360 to these Steam games, like Shoot One Up and Weapon of Choice and Explosion Aid, we enhanced them a lot. We spent the whole summer fixing them up. Trading cards, achievements, leaderboards, Steam Cloud, you know, a keyboard, mouse input, remappable controls, so everything. From a technical standpoint, is that something you did because you felt like, well, the PC, uh, the PC allows for for greater details without too much of a hassle, or is it just because you started looking at the game and saying, hmm, let me brush that up a little? I mean, I can't stand a bad port. It, Thank it's you. a quick turn off for me. And we as gamers appreciate uh, when developers uh, have that approach. To anything. Like, I was really sad when the OUYA came out and there was all these oh, obvious so touch screen ports. It's so gross, yeah. you know? And then the most disgusting thing is like you start up your PC game and, and it, all it does is talk about the A button or the X button. And you're just like, I mean, I made, all of our games are, should be dynamic. Like, so if you're on the keyboard, when you start it up, you don't see mention, maybe it says st the start button and the enter key. You know what I mean? But like, I, I just hate it when it sounds like it's only a console game. And you're like, come on, you know, so. Why do, yeah, why do you think uh, most of the industry treats us like crap, frankly? PC why? Ga PC gamers, yeah. We, we've got last year, we've got nothing but bad ports. Uh, it's it's made, even even a game like Batman or Arkham Knight, which is supposed to have a big budget, and, and that process could be... Uh, that was a nightmare, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, was, it killed some of our people's rigs um, that bad. It's, um, so Just, we're very nervous. Uh, essentially, the PC gaming community, when a game comes out, we're nervous uh, before we try it because we don't know if it's going to fry our graphics card or something. So I, I hate to make us sound like you know we're victims here, but it's true. There seems to be very little care for PC as a platform. And ironically, at the same time, PC is the game development platform. I know. It doesn't make any sense. Right. It makes no sense. Like, how can you be? We are. All, I mean, like when we were doing the PlayStation Three. I'll tell you this: when we were on the PlayStation Three at Insomniac, what would happen is you're on your computer, and then you have to deploy it to like the PlayStation Three. So at some point during development, you do move over to the hardware, and you're only on the PlayStation hardware. You know what I mean, or something like that. Um, but it is ironic that yeah, for a long time you're on the PC. What what gives? So I don't know what happened to Bat and Arkham Knight. I mean, that was just unbelievable. My brother-in-law, he loved it. He, I mean, but before, but it got better. And after it got better, he played it a bunch. But like, we were just laughing about just what a cluster bomb that was. I mean, yeah, indeed. I don't even know. <laughs> like, you just scratch your head. Um, you do in the in the chat. I, I, one of the one of our guys calls it Arkham Knight, uh, Batman: The Refund Edition. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what it was for us. Seriously, man. I mean, like, my guess is they take you for granted. Yeah. They just, like, you're the majority, and they just think you'll always be there. And I, I think we're kind of, first of all, I think we, we have the label of being the beta testers. And so because we're testing everything, all the, all, the indie, all the indie games are coming out on Steam first, and it's okay, there's early access, which is a wild thing for us. It's okay. We're used to playing games that don't really work. Uh, so I, I think there's that. And then I think there's yeah. a simple matter of mathematics. You, you're going to sell AAA studios. Or, and you, you probably know that mentality quite a bit. Uh, AAA studios are going to sell a lot more on consoles than they are going to sell on PC. And so we come last. I know. It's just... It's sad. I don't... It's so sad. Because the true I mean, game... The, the is it I, piracy I, that well, you don't sell as much on PC? Like, why would it not sell as well? I don't know. You know? Yeah, I, I don't know. Bec I, I feel like because the most hardcore gamers, the ones who really care, who actually go through the trouble of first spending the money and then building the machines themselves and figuring yeah. out, you know, which cable pay. connects to what. Yeah. Uh, they would pay, right? We'd pay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we would pay. Well, you know, I pay. haven't checked that um, the Steam, um, uh, what's the thing where they uh, they poll everybody and ask them what their hardware specs are? You know what I mean? Like, I feel like... Is the, it, is the community forums you mean on Steam? No, 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 no. There's that thing where you can, um, the hardware specs, like they, they don't interview people, but they just, what do you call it, dang it, where they find out what your specs are. You just kind of... They report on, um, it's a survey, that's it, survey. Okay, yeah, okay, and yeah, you can yeah. check and see, I use that as a developer to find out, okay, what's the most important hardware resolutions, the screen resolutions, you know what I mean? What yeah. kind of audio card, graphics card, what's everybody using? 
But um, what I wonder is if you took a slice of that and looked at the population of people that have machines, PC machines that are as powerful or more powerful than the current consoles, would that buying population be bigger than the total console market? Or huh. not? You know what I mean? And is that why yeah. you do that? Like, is that smaller? Most likely. I, I mean, yeah, most, I think most likely you're right. Because no. I think the hardware, the, 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 the total PC market is bigger, I would assume. Yeah. They, well, yeah, because every, I mean, everybody has a PC. Technically, everybody you can play a video game and since Steam is free to download, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's much bigger, but the actual guys who can run, I don't know, uh, Tomb Raider, Battlefront, and uh, yeah, the best, yeah, the like, Call of Duty, yeah, probably is a lot. Well, Call of Duty, probably a lot less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, but um, maybe that's why they're like that. It makes me sad, though, because. It could a lazy change. Port, man, is sad. A lazy port is a sad thing. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think if uh, if Steam plays its cards right and moves the moves the PC platform into the living room with their Steam machines and all that, and like they got a good business plan, good that point. I think it could change because even even console gamers are going to realize. So I buy this machine, I'm stuck with it for seven years. Or I, th I buy this machine, it's approximately the same power, the same price, except I can replace just one little part in two years and make it something modern again. So yeah. I think they, I think the console market is going to have to address that and maybe they're even going to start building machines that very much evolve like PC. So at the end, I think it's all going to confound itself into just several parts you can buy, assemble together easily and play on your TV, on your, on your monitor. That, mm -hmm. To me, that's all going to fade away. But what's important, and to get back to the focus of this interview, is that devs, <laughs> developers, that the market remains open like this to developers who want to pull out of the big industry and start their own thing. So Nathan, thanks very much for taking the time to to get to talk to us, and we mm -hmm. we're going. Thanks for donating a bunch of Steam keys. We're going to throw them out to the people in the chat at the end of the interviews. Wonderful. But I'm not going to leave you without you telling us what's next. Uh, you said a project that you put on the side. If you can tell us why you put it on the side, and maybe if you're going to get back to it, if you're going to get back to it, excuse me. Um, give us give us the future of uh, of Mama's <laughs> best games. Okay, here we go. Where is it? Uh, within a before Thanksgiving, this game is already out. It's a free download. It's a free to play <laughs> game uh, with incentivized ads, so you don't even have to watch an ad. It's called Finger Derpy, like D E R P Y. It's a very silly game. It's a funny horse racing game. We're doing a Thanksgiving update with playable turkeys. It's really <laughs> silly. It's on <laughs> iOS and Android right now. It's got horses and other crazy animals. It's very funny, and it's a it's a great game. Finger Derpy is out now, so we're doing that update. That's what I'm. That's what I'm rolling off of right now. I'm actually just in the middle of testing that. I'll be testing it tonight still. Um, the next big project that we're in the middle of, I'm still working on. That's it's a big one. It's a puzzle action game called Pig Eat Ball. Uh, yeah, okay, that's your picture. Yes, that's the big game. If you go to pigeatball.com or check out the Facebook, um, you can see what it's like. It's it's like um, it's just, the, the, the name. In, in a way, the name. Um, I had trouble keeping like a straight sort of, face. By the way, I had trouble <laughs> keeping the whole time the interview. I was staring at you with the big. big is my in my my interview <laughs> picture looks like big. How, yeah. how do I stay professional here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, together. Pig ball. Um. So the gameplay, what the gameplay structure, I kind of um I like I like into uh, Mario Galaxy. It's okay. so this game is not 3D or anything like that. But what it's like is. Every time you get into a new area, there's all new crazy gameplay to deal with and all kinds of new fun things to, you know, to get involved with. So the game, one of the core concepts in the main gameplay is imagine Miss Pac-Man going through a maze, but every time she ate a pellet, she got fatter and fatter and fatter. <laughs> so this game involves getting fat. It involves getting stuck. It involves barking. Genius. It involves I'm eating a fan. Pot. It's really weird, but it's not super gross. It's only a little gross. Oh, it sounds, uh, it sounds yeah. lovely. It's not it super gross. It's very silly and funny and crazy. So piggyball.com. It's um, you got us. We're, we'll review it. If you'll send us a key, we oh, yeah. can count okay. on us that we'll like, review that game. We should have something. I'm not, I'm not saying we're up for 100% going into early access, but we're looking at early access in, um, in uh, say, January, February. Is, is, would like, that be your first early access? 
That'll yeah, we the game's greenlit. We're all ready to go, um, and we've got a bunch of games on Steam. But this is the first time we've gone into early access, and the reason we're thinking about it, sure, is because it's got a local co-op, it's got a level editor. There's a lot you know to look at, and I'd love to get balance issues out. I mean, I think honestly, I think if you're really someone of a polished product, if it's not too early on uh, yeah. into development, or at the very least, if you're frank about what you're delivering to the audience, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, early access. It gets a well, lot of heat. Uh, but that's the thing. Yeah, we want to make sure when we get when we put if we put it up there, we're gonna make sure that I mean it's clearly not done because it would be done if it's done. But we're gonna make sure it's polished. And you're also quite frankly as a studio, you're all, you don't come off as the type of guys who are here to become billionaire. Uh, your your products are very very accessible. I I think Explosion it is three ninety nine. Yeah, um, yeah. So you're not going for the 60 bucks game uh, and then oh, run, yeah, yeah. run no, away to some island. Uh, we know we've got a reputation to uphold, so we don't want to blow that, you know. It's awesome. It's uh, yeah. We love games, and the more we can play piggy ball, <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I got to check it out. You're going to like six months from now, you're going to be really happy you did. I send you an email, so. Nathan. I will personally let you know what I think of piggy ball, <laughs> right. and I will be sincere. <laughs> okay, I'm looking forward to it, man. I will let you know what my wife thinks of piggy ball. <laughs> It's got a co-op mode. It'll be fun. <laughs> she endorsed hey, you it. You should look at, get your wife to play um, Finger Derpy with you. You can play on the same device. <laughs> okay, so, I promise you. On Android or whatever. It's fun. <laughs> if your studio can make my wife a lover of video game, I'll, I'll hats off, definitely. Well, I don't know if she'll love it, but she'll at least smile. I know that. It's very silly. So You have not met her. <laughs> oh, hey, just that actually doesn't listen to the internet. all right all right check it out you'll see nathan okay. thanks a whole lot uh we'll, we'll send you a link as as soon as the interview is up if you're in the chat and you want to play explosion aid you'll be able to because nathan was nice enough to donate quite a few keys so we'll be throwing them out like candy uh, we'll be messaging them. Nathan, thanks a lot. Please send us any update and whatever we can do within our humble capacity, we will to support. Uh, we're big fans here. Obviously, we gave uh, Explosion Aid a 90 out of 100, which is very occasional on our website. You've got some really tough writers, some really tough graders. Uh, for the rest of you, check us out. Opinoops.com, PC Gaming by PC Gamers. We're community built, community oriented. Uh, if you want to join us, just go on the website and connect with us. You'll find multiple of ways to do so. Nathan, again, Thanks. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to a young community like ours, and we will be in touch shortly. Everybody, have a great night, and Stylomax, you can take us off the channel. <laughs>